Hello again. Uh, today we are going to continue talking about instrumental genres. Uh, last time I talked about the mid-baroque violinist composer Arcangelo Corelli, and today I'm going to talk about the late baroque uh, Italian violinist composer Antonio Vivaldi. Um, last time I talked about the genre called the sonata, and today I'm going to talk about the genre called the concerto. So the book discusses Vivaldi and the concerto together, uh, but there are actually two different types of concerto, and so they also discuss the, the other type, the concerto grosso, a little bit earlier. So we, we kind of have to um, turn back and forth a little bit in the book. So this section, just to, to let you know, again, if you're using the ninth brief edition, the place where they talk about the concerto grosso and also about ritornello form is uh, beginning on page 110 in the ninth brief edition and uh, proceeds for oh, about four pages after that. And there's a listening example, which happens to be the first movement of a Concerto Grosso by J.S. Bach, the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 5. Okay, but then later on in the book, a few pages later, um, they have a little discussion of Antonio Vivaldi, and this is beginning on page 128. So they talk about Vivaldi, and then they talk about his solo concerto, a three-movement concerto for violin and orchestra called La Primavera, or Spring, how we translate in English. And so I'm going to talk about the concerto, but also talk about Vivaldi. Because although Vivaldi composed all kinds of music, he is probably best known for his concertos. He composed over 450 concertos for various instruments, uh, both types of concertos um, that we're going to talk about today. So um, let's talk first about Vivaldi. And then I'll talk about the concerto. How's that? Uh, Antonio Vivaldi was born in 1678. Um, he was uh, a Catholic priest um, and also happened to be uh, among the greatest violinists, certainly, of his time, if not the greatest. Um, now, interestingly, uh, Vivaldi, although you think, okay, a priest, so he's, you know, he has a parish and he says mass and hears confession. That's not what he did, actually. Um, he worked as a music teacher at a girls' school. It was actually an, an orphanage for girls who were not really orphans. Um, now, what the heck does that mean? Well, they were not, it, was, it was an orphanage, but actually it was, it, these girls, their parents, for, for the most part, were alive. It's just that they were uh, born out of wedlock. And in those days, and this is in Venice, okay, um, I already mentioned Venice actually once before, and I was talking about Claudia Monteverdi. Um, and I talked about how Venice was uh, a, a cultural and commercial hub. It was a powerful, wealthy, independent republic um, and had been an important cultural center for a very long time, actually, for, through the Renaissance and uh, well into the Baroque era. Well, in Venice, <clears throat> there was this, as there were in, in uh, cities all across Europe, there was this institution for girls who were born out of wedlock. And I'm going to go off on a little bit of a sort of a social history digression here because I think it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so then as now, sometimes uh, people had children out of wedlock. Um, but in, in those days, having a boy was considered a good thing and having a girl was considered not such a good thing. And it's not just for the, the obvious reasons you might think of sexism or preferring male children, uh, which is, which is a, a, a thing for sure, but it had to do really with economics because um, it had to do with dowries, actually, mainly. If you were, if you had a, a boy, okay, that meant that someday that boy was going to be married, and in those times, the the father of the bride would actually pay the father of the groom. Would there would be a trans a money transaction, which was an important part of uh, of marriages in those days. Um, a dowry is 
money that is paid by the family of the bride to the family of the groom. Right. So <clears throat> let's say you are let's say you are a, a, a young couple. You're not married, but you're let's say fooling around and um, you unexpectedly get pregnant. What are you going to do? Well, um, it, it's possible you could just go ahead and get married. Or you might want to wait and see if the baby turns out to be a boy or a, or a girl. Um, if it's a boy, you might go ahead and, and decide to get married uh, because someday that boy is going. To, first of all, it, you know you could you know, the, the boy is <clears throat> for you know helpful in let's say the family business, and someday that boy is going to bring in a dowry from whomever he marries. But if you have a girl, that means someday you will have to pay a dowry to someone else. Uh, in order for your daughter to be married. Well, why couldn't my daughter just not get married? It just kind of wasn't an option in those days. In those days, um, if, you, if you did not marry as a young lady, you had only two other options, to become a nun or to become a prostitute. So, um, dowries were very important. And in many different cities, for example, in Florence, they had actually a public fund that was set up uh, to provide dowries for girls from from poor families so that they wouldn't be forced into the into that choice. Okay, so and they also had these institutions like the Pietà, which is the, the place where uh, Vivaldi worked. And by the way, these these um, orphanages, so-called, uh, they had a, a little sort of a compartment built into the side of the building with a sort of a lazy Susan, sort of a turntable inside so that you could, let's say if you're dropping the baby off, uh, you would, you know, uh, maybe pay a visit late at night when no one would see you, and you would open up this compartment in the side of the building, put the baby in there, uh, close that uh, that compartment door, uh, and then spin the turntable so now the baby is on the inside of the building, and ring a little bell, and the monks or the nuns or whoever that would run the place uh, would hear the bell ring, they would come down, they would say, okay, we have a new, uh, a, a, a new baby to take care of, a mouth to feed. Okay, so, what do you, if you are one of those monks or those nuns or those priests like Vivaldi who works at one of the institutions, what are you going to do with these girls? Um, well, one thing you can do, actually, that will help them in a very practical way is to train them in music. Because, um, Part of being a, an attractive prospect for a, for a bride, for, for a young woman, um, for example, especially if you didn't have a lot of money for a dowry, right? If you're from a poor family. If you were very cultured and educated, in particular if you were skilled in music, that was something that would make up for, potentially, uh, the lack of a dowry. If you were a good musician. So this is a time when women... Although they are not generally professional musicians, with very few exceptions, for example, opera singers, um, but instrumentalists, never. Composers, never. I mean, there were some who composed uh, as a pastime, um, and there were certainly some excellent amateur uh, female musicians. Women were expected, women of a certain class, let's say middle class and higher, were expected to be excellent amateur musicians and to provide entertainment in the home, this kind of thing, and to train uh, the children of the family in music. But they were not expected, but they were actively discouraged from being professional musicians. Men, on the other hand, uh, were obviously the, most of the professional musicians and composers. That's just kind of how the way the world was. And it, it, was, it was that way not just in regard to music, but in, you know, just generally. Um, until fairly recently, of course, women generally did not have careers. Uh, so, uh, the, the people who worked in places like the Pietà, like Vivaldi, took this very seriously. It was not just um, a matter of uh, giving these girls culture and, and whatnot. It, was, it sort of had a very practical end. They will, they will have a better and easier life if they learn music because that will make it more likely that they will be attractive to someone as a bride, and therefore they won't be forced into, uh, uh, you know, a, a life that, like that of a nun or of a prostitute. Um, 
So, um, Vivaldi, in his capacity as music director at the Pietà, uh, composed hundreds of concertos, in addition to lots of other pieces, for his girls to perform. And, and the orchestra of the Pietà, uh, composed entirely of tween and teenage girls, was one of the best orchestras in Europe. And they were actually kind of a tourist attraction. So people from all over Europe would go to Venice uh, because, again, it was a cultural hub. And they would, uh, especially people who were into music, would go to Venice, would go to the opera house, take in Venetian opera, and they would pay a visit to the chapel of the Pietà. Because every Sunday in the chapel, this orchestra, conducted by Vivaldi, would perform. And as the book notes, they would actually perform uh, behind a, a, a screen, behind sort of a lattice work, so that you could hear them, but you could not see them. Because it was, you know, I guess considered too, um, it was liable to cause impure thoughts to see these teenage girls playing musical instruments. Uh, kind of risque in those days. So, um, that's what Vivaldi did. Now, Vivaldi was pretty well known in his lifetime, but after his death, he uh, kind of slipped into obscurity. Uh, his music was not performed very much um, and until, uh, I believe, the, the 1960s or so. There was a sort of a revival of interest in, in Vivaldi's music, and it began to be performed again. And the piece that is in your book as an example uh, of a work by Vivaldi is one of the best known pieces of classical music. You've probably heard it before. You might not have known what it was or who it was by, but if you've ever been on hold with customer service or in an elevator or in a department store, you might you hear it on TV sometimes, you've undoubtedly heard uh, the Vivaldi concerto uh, called the Spring. Now, of those 450-odd concertos that Vivaldi wrote, Four of them in particular, four concertos, were composed by Vivaldi uh, as a set, and they are an example of what we call program music. So this is a new vocabulary term, program music. Program music is purely instrumental music that has a program that sort of tells a specific story or has a sort of a definite meaning that is often associated with, let's say, a story, a poem, a painting, something that inspired the artist, the composer, uh, and which is made explicit. In other words, there has to be a descriptive title in a piece of program music. And sometimes that's all there is, right? Uh, so, for example, if a composer writes a piece for piano called Spring, let's say, or uh, A Storm, or something like this, um, as opposed to giving it a title like Sonata. Remember, Sonata doesn't really mean anything. It just means instrumental work. It's a very generic title. Um, if we have a title like The Storm or Spring, all we really need is that title to put the suggestion in the listener's mind. The listener will say, oh, uh, you know, they, they're kind of knowing what to listen for now. Like, oh, it's, it's about spring. I'd be thinking thoughts of spring. Or The Storm. Maybe there's going to be some sort of thunder and lightning effects. Um, so, in, in some program music, that's all there is, is there's just a, a title which is descriptive, rather than a title that is generic, like sonata, or symphony, or even concerto is kind of a generic title. It doesn't tell you anything about the content, about what you're supposed to feel, about the mood, about what it's about. Um, by the way, when we have music like that that does not have a program, um, we call that absolute music. So the opposite of program music is absolute music. Um, okay, so uh, we've just learned a new vocabulary term, program music. Vivaldi's concertos, uh, most of them are not program music. Most of them are absolute music. They just have a title like concerto in A minor or whatever. But four of them in particular, um, Vivaldi composed as a set and he named each one of them after the different seasons. And they're often performed as a set. Uh, 
um, that is, you go to a concert, sometimes all four of these concertos are performed on the program. So in order they are spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Right? And the one that's in, in your book, uh, as an example, is spring. Definitely the best known of these four. Right? Um, okay, so I'll come back to talking more specifically about this particular concerto. In fact, I'll probably make another video because this is going to go on. Uh, this is going to be a two-part deal talking about Vivaldi and the concerto. So I've talked about Vivaldi, his career, um, and uh, a, a little bit about these four concertos, one of which is in your listening. Now I'm going to talk about the, the concerto a bit more generally as a genre of instrumental music. So a concerto is a piece for orchestra, but it's not just for orchestra. It's for orchestra and something else. There are two main types of concerto. The concerto grosso, grosso just means big, the big concerto, and the solo concerto. And there's really not much difference between them. The concerto grosso is a piece for a small group and orchestra. Uh, the small group is called the concertino. And by the way, concertino is simply the Italian word for small group. Um, the word concerto, uh, it's, it's just like the, the, the word concert, but with an O on the end of it. And you might think, oh, that makes sense. A concert is where you go to hear music. Um, and so concerts have something to do with music. That's actually, that's not really the intrinsic, you know, the meaning of the word. The concerto, the, it has to do with coming together as a group. And sometimes you hear people use the, the term uh, concert this way, like working in concert with so-and-so, we managed to accomplish whatever task, you know, working in concert, working as a group. That's really what the meaning of concert is. So the, the con, for example, the C-O-N means with, right? When you think of like consolidated, a confederation, uh, any of that con means to bring together, to with. Uh, chili con carne is a chili with meat. Um, anyway, uh, so Concerto means a, a piece for a group, for a, 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 a group of instrumentalists. It's an instrumental piece. Sometimes it's for a group, meaning the orchestra, and an individual soloist. Sometimes it's for a group, the orchestra, and a smaller group within the big group called the concertino. Um, now here's another term for you. Tutti. Tutti is simply the Italian word for all. Right. Have you ever heard of tutti frutti ice cream? Tutti frutti means all fruits. And if you've got all the different fruits all mashed up together in your ice cream, you've got tutti frutti ice cream. So tutti means all. There are sections within a concerto where everybody is playing. The entire orchestra and the soloist, or the entire orchestra and the small group, the concertino, if we're talking about a concerto grosso. So there are sections when everybody is playing, and those sections are labeled Tutti. The composer would actually write in, in the old days, Tutti, in the score, meaning everybody plays here. Right? Um, so even today we talk about, if we're performing a concerto, we talk about the Tutti sections versus the solo sections. Um, here's another thing to know about concertos. They are almost always three movement works. They are multi-movement works and they tend to be three movements. Now, I said last uh, lecture about multi-movement works. The, things, the thing that distinguishes one movement from another, the main thing, is the tempo. Right? Um, so we will have an alternation between fast and slow tempos, and this is a way of attaining variety of mood. So in a concerto, typically we have three movements. The first movement is fast, the second movement is slow, and the third movement is fast again. Um, here's another thing that the book talks about. Now, this is something that the book discusses back in the earlier section on the Concerto Grosso. Uh, this is back in page 110 or so. Um, ritornello form. So this is another uh, term to know. Uh, ritornello simply means the thing that returns. Right? The ritornello 
is the main theme of the first and last movement of a concerto. We talk about the first and last movement, the two fast movements. We could also refer to them as the outer movements of the concerto. Those two movements will be in a particular type of form we call ritornello form because they have a main theme that we hear at the very beginning that returns periodically. And that form will be found in the first movement and the last movement. Now, in talking about form, which we haven't done a lot of so far, we haven't talked specifically about different types of forms. I've talked about the general concept of what form is. I did this way back in the first unit when I talked about the elements of music. Uh, and I've made the point a couple times since then, I think, that form in music is simply the arrangement of different sections. And in coming up with the form of a piece of music, the composer kind of has to strike a balance between repetition of certain elements and variety, right? So we have to repeat things. We have to uh, either restate things or have things appear over here and then come back later to provide some continuity to a musical work. But of course, we can't always just be repeating the same thing over and over again or the audience becomes bored. So we need to have variety as well. We need to hear different stuff once in a while. We need both continuity, which is caused by repetition, and variety. And we need them in some kind of proportion to each other. We can't have all, they're both good things, uh, but we can't have uh, too much of one or too much of the other. There has to be kind of a, a balance between the two of them. And in the form of just about any piece of music, you can see how the composer is trying to strike this balance to give the right amount of repetition, which gives a feeling of continuity, but also variety. Okay, so what the ritornello does is to provide that uh, continuity, that feeling of continuity. In between the appearances of the ritornello, which are usually presented by the tutti. In other words, usually when we're hearing the ritornello, everybody is playing, the entire orchestra and the soloist. But in between those appearances of the ritornello, we have different stuff. And that different stuff is usually provided by the soloist or soloists, the small group, the concertino. The form is the same, whether we're talking about the concerto grosso or the solo concerto. Right? So sometimes I'm going to use the word soloist or soloists. Right? Um, in either case, in ritornello form, we simply alternate back and forth between two D sections, which are presenting the ritornello, and solo sections, which are presenting some contrasting material. That contrasting material is usually kind of flashy, technically difficult. A concerto is kind of a showpiece. It's meant to show off the ability, the virtuosity of the soloist or soloists. Okay? That's sort of the whole idea. It's kind of a showpiece. So in ritornello form, what I've done is I've actually made a one of my visual aids here. Um, I'm just going to hold this up to the phone, the camera, and it appears to be reversed, but maybe it'll de-reverse itself uh, <laughs> when we actually look at it on the screen. I don't know. Um, but the uh, outer movements, as you see there, I I've got a little overview. Okay, Concerto Grosso, a piece for a small group uh, and orchestra. The Solo Concerto, a piece for an individual soloist plus orchestra. The outer movements of the three movements, those fast movements, and by the way, I always use Roman numerals when I'm talking about different movements. Those outer movements are going to be in ritornello form. And I've got it diagrammed down here at the bottom. So first we have, the first thing we always hear is the tutti, the entire orchestra, along with the soloist, playing the ritornello melody. And in the case of the Vivaldi, the first movement of the Vivaldi, that, that ritornello melody is very familiar. It's this thing. Okay, that's the ritornello melody. Then, after we've heard that ritornello melody, we hear the soloist presenting something different. I'm just calling it X, right? It's just some new material. 
and it will usually be flashy, technically difficult, challenging, you know. And then after that, we hear the tutti, the entire orchestra come back in and a reappearance of the ritornello melody. Then uh, we have the soloist or soloists come back in with something different yet again. We'll call it Y. After that passes, the tutti uh, jump back in with the ritornello melody. Then the soloist will come back in with something different yet again. I'm calling it Z. This can go on and on for as long as the composer wants, right? There could be, oh, you know, many more. I've just got three different, I, I only had room on the paper, for three different solo sections, but there could be many more than this. One thing that we will find is that the composer will end with the ritornello, with the tutti playing the ritornello. He's going to end with the same material that he began with, to sort of round things off, uh, and and uh, give a feeling, again, of continuity, of unity, and cohesiveness to the overall movement. Now, although the first and the third movements will be in the same form, they will have different themes. They'll have different material. So they will sound different. They might have a different mood, right? And they will certainly have different melodic material. It's just that the arrangement, the structure, will be similar between the first and and the last movement. They'll both be in ritornello form. The second movement, the slow movement, will not be in ritornello form. What form will it be in? We don't need to worry about that. It could be, you know, it could be different from one composition to the next. There, in the second movement, there is no expectation of a particular form. There is no correct answer for what the form will be. There's a, a lot of different possibilities that the, the composer could decide to go with. But it was expected that uh, the composer would use ritornello form in the first and third movements, in the fast movements, or what we call the outer movements. Um, now, uh, the example by J.S. Bach, right, in, in that musical example, they're just giving you the first movement of the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 5. This is a concerto grosso. It's called the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 5 because it is one of a set of six concertos that uh, Bach sent as a present to a nobleman uh, who was the, his title was the Margrave of Brandenburg. Uh, Bach had met this nobleman and actually probably hoped to get a job working for him. So he put together six concertos that he'd already composed um, had, it, had them nicely bound and wrote a dedication to the uh, Margrave of Brandenburg and sent them off to this guy, hoping probably to get a letter, a letter back, maybe offering him a job, which never happened. For all we know, these, these six concertos probably just sat on a, on a shelf in, in this uh, nobleman's library someplace. But today they are uh, they're recognized as some of the greatest orchestral works of the Baroque era. The uh, Brandenburg Concerto Number no. Five, in particular, is is well known because it has a very uh, a very virtuosic keyboard part. The keyboard is really featured in the Brandenburg Number no. Five. Um, in the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. Five, you've got the orchestra and the small group. The small group consists of flute, violin, and harpsichord. Right? And toward the end of that first movement. There is a very long harpsichord solo, right, where the, all the, the rest of the orchestra uh, stops playing and just the harpsichord continues on for several minutes. Um, this kind of solo, by the way, within a concerto, this solo section is called a cadenza. Um, and, this can, and when you listen to it, it takes a while to get to it because this movement is a, it's quite long. Um, it's about... Oh, uh, 10, 11 minutes long. And the cadenza is at the very end. And it sounds kind of like a heavy metal guitar solo, actually, uh, especially toward the end. It sounds like something, I don't know, Eddie Van Halen would have done uh, back in the 70s or 80s. Um, so uh, listen to that Bach Brandenburg concerto. Um, and next lecture, I'll probably talk about Vivaldi's Spring Concerto, 
and maybe also a little bit more about this Brandenburg Concerto one. And uh, I'll we'll listen to them and I'll point out some of the specific features. Okay, so see you next time for more about Vivaldi and Bach and concertos.